Hey everyone, it's Debbie and I'm back again to do another podcast. I swear I've had a recording almost every day, last couple of weeks, and it's so much fun to record podcasts. And especially with my guests today who I've known, oh my gosh, I was just thinking 20 years. <laughs> Somehow I been doing, I started Ironman. I made Canada it was my first race in 2001 and my last Ironman North America was in 2012. And my first Ironman Hawaii, I called by four, I think it was 2004 or five. And then my last one was 2012. And if you want to know what's happened 2013 to 2022, you can go back and listen to the beginning podcast or find my book on Amazon. That is me sharing my journey and what happened to me so I can help you avoid going through what happened and starting in 2013, my book's called life is not a race. It is a journey and how chronic stress can impact the whole you from the inside out. So my guest is my coach that I had in 2000. Hmm. I think I started doing the coaching program in 2003 or 2002. I started Ironman Canada but once maybe 0304. And then I joined the elite team in 2004 and raced on and off with this elite team, triathlon team for Ironman until I was retiring, took some time off. Cause I thought I would try to get pregnant and that never happened probably because of what happened later is adrenal exhaustion, HPA axis dysfunction leads to metabolic chaos, leads to hormone dysregulation and all sorts of problems. <laughs> so my guest today is my coach, Mark Allen, and you might've heard of him if you've been a part of Ironman community and history of Ironman is Mark Allen, Dave Scott back in the day. And here on the website, you can see if you're watching the video, Mark Allen sports.com. You can learn all about his coaching life, coaching, motivational speaking. And today we're going to talk about TriDot and his coaching program and a little bit more. So he's been on my show over the years since I have had this podcast, you may not know for 10 years, and it used to be called fit fat fast talking with John Smith was the co-host. And we talked about how you can burn more fat by eating fat 10 years ago. And I talked a lot about metabolic efficiency testing and had Mark Allen on the show many times. So TriDot is this program I keep getting emails on and I was curious. And then I saw Mark was using it for his coaching platform. So we're going to talk to Mark about that, how it is a personalized program, calculating your swim, bike, and run workouts and how it can help us simplify training and looking at your race goals and all that. So that's what we're doing today. Uh, back in the years I started doing Mark Allen coaching program in 2002 or three, whatever it was, I started to qualify for Ironman Hawaii. I was doing the low heart rate training way back when, and I was already doing heart rate training. I actually, this is, I'm really sounding old, but Sally Edwards, where I used to work at the Bellevue club, Bellevue, Washington, we did heart zone training and dance skin coaching for the beginning triathlon we had once upon a time and was already into heart rate training and math tone training, max aerobic function, MAF heart rate formula. We will probably all know about the 180 minus your age and Mark Allen, of course, if you know the history of Phil Maffetone and Mark Allen, you can go back and find information and podcasts and videos on how Maffetone trained Mark Allen and how Mark created that aerobic engine doing that 80% low intensity heart rate. And then strategically adding in that higher intensity quality key speed sessions. Now I've been doing the endure IQ program the past few months doing the courses on endure IQs for the 101 and the 201. I still need to do the two others, but it's, it's for endurance athletes, triathletes specifically doing low carb, high fat training and fueling and training. And it's a great overview of how Dr. Dan Plews has researched and fine tuned the low carb athlete for endurance racing based on his experience and his research studies in metabolic testing 
And if you're curious, learn more, I'll put that in the show notes. If my assistants will remember into your IQ.com, I think it is. And then we'll talk to Mark more, his coaching program, but how he might do the 80, 20 program. If it's low carb, if it's train low race high, and how do we match our fueling and training as I like to ask everyone And as well as how do we work on eliminating, you don't eliminate, but reduce those sources of external stressors, those energy robbers in your life. And then those hidden internal stressors I talk about all the time that you don't know about unless you test. So, you know, starting point is I did a little video the other day on getting your blood chemistry tests from your doctor and working with a practitioner as myself or another FDM practitioner, where we can take those values from your doctor and let's put them in a a shorter range for optimal and functional medicine and looking at those high and low numbers. What does that mean? What's the indication of, so we can find a lot of internal hidden stressors that way we might be impacting the hormones, immune system, detoxification, digestion, energy systems and nervous systems. So I like to look at helping the athlete be fit and healthy from the inside out, as well as happy looking at the holistic method. Now, Mark Allen, I would use for creating great training programs. And so we'll talk to him about that and see how TriDot platform works. But Mark is absolutely amazing. And I always keep in touch with them and uh, send him messages to get down here at Solana Beach. So we'll talk about that. Ironman Hawaii. I'm not getting to this year in 2022. I was going to go. I usually go and like to be a part of the events and cheer on people that I know racing and my old Mark Allen elite team. I know Diana Hassel and some other people and Carrie Craig, they're still racing and there's a big community there that gets to be your annual family at Ironman in the community. And I always love it. So I will be there 2023. Sounds like space age, but 2022 is a little bit chaotic. I think this year to be going, it'll be super crowded on the island and way too many people. So I I didn't really want to go. Honestly, it's a female only race on the Thursday. They have to, you know, set up everything, close the town down and tear it all down and then do it all over again for the regular race on Saturday, but that will be men's only. So it'll be interesting year to watch online. And if you're there, have a great time, but just be ready for getting those street bikes out there and not renting a car and just, you know, getting the bike that you pay by the minute kind of thing. Those are great to go on a Leahy drive and just hang out there and just don't get in your car and just walk or bike. So what Mark's done for me is a lot of the, the working on your inner soul. He, over the years, that fit body fit soul. And I think that's an important part of my journey is learning how to you know, be in nature, find my happy place and really learn how to manage your stressors and doing some breathing exercises. I've never actually gone to his training. I will ask if he's still doing them, but I think, you know, just any spiritual connection you can, I know Ben Greenfield does this a lot in his programs that we do nowadays. And I find like, I didn't know I was that unhappy and that stressed out until I left my life as I knew it in Bellevue, Washington during COVID, just after COVID started, we decided we can live anywhere. And we wanted to always live in North San Diego and, uh, sold the house in a week and moved in June, 2020 and been here since. So I am just happy living a good outdoor life. And, you know, we call it the quality of life move. So point I'm rambling about is that to be a fit and healthy and happy athlete, it is working on the whole, you, the holistic method and really not just focusing on just your training, but are you recovering? Well, are you having fun and time with your family? Are you laughing? Are you measuring your heart rate variability to see if you're bouncing back? And are you eating the right foods? I think so much of us are in that energy deficit that we're burning so many calories, not taking in enough because we're trying to do fasted workouts, trying to do low carb, high fat and get our protein in. But then we're and I did this and I'm trying to switch this is not eating enough. And so that can contribute to additional stress, but really looking at your training schedule from a holistic approach that if you want to be the best athlete and the best version of yourself now and your future self, we really want to work on all these elements I talk about. So here's Mark, let me bring him in and we'll talk shop with him. Hold on. 
All right. I have Mr. Mark Allen on the podcast. It's been a few years since you've been on the show, but thanks for making time for me today to get you back on here and to talk shop. I know it's been too long, huh? You've been doing your, your Monday show. You've got a big following on your social media. You've been doing, what do you call it? Monday. Mondays with Mark Allen. Oh yeah. And simple. They're, they're, <laughs> it's on YouTube. And I put it on my Instagram channel, Mark Allen, Mark Allen grip. And uh, it's sometimes it's tips on stuff. Sometimes it's just random thoughts. Sometimes it's interviews with people. Um, and so anyway, it's just kind of like whatever's going on, you know, and I like to it's it's been fun because I've <clears throat> I think it kind of came out of COVID when, you know, people were not doing things in person. And so it's like I want to be putting stuff out there and feel like I'm at least communicating with people. And so we started doing that. Uh, Mondays with Mark Allen. And and then I also have uh, going into Kona right now, Road to Kona. Uh, it's, I did a road to St. George for the, the world championships that they just had there in May. And that was a little bit easier to get athletes to in, engage and do interviews with them and lead up into the race. But Kona pinning down a professional triathlete uh, is almost impossible. I've had a number of them say, oh, I just don't have the time, you know, and I get it. Yeah. I get it. You know, I mean, it's it, it will be the first Ironman World Championship in Hawaii since 2019, three years. Yeah. So, you know, there's there's been a, a lot of a lot of changes, I think, in, in the makeup of the, the top folks. You know, the young people. They really, uh, you know, they had some time to just sit back and train and try to figure stuff out. And obviously they have. It's like a whole new generation winning. You know, Chris Blumenfeld and, you know, Gustav Eden and the men and, um, you know, like, uh, I mean, Daniela is still up there, of course, mm -hmm. but uh, it'll be interesting to see if, let's say, for example, Anna Haug can come back and defend. Yeah. She's she's actually the the returning Kona champion, even though she's not the current Ironman world champ because Daniela won in May. But anyway, yeah, cool it's stuff. hard. It's hard to calculate like the years and then what does that really count? But you want it to count because it mm -hmm. lasts a few years. I'm sure for them, they want to be the Ironman Hawaii, but not in Hawaii <laughs> championship mm -hmm. and what just scratched the last three years. And so this year is going to be kind of crazy because I was just saying in the intro is that the, the women are all on Thursday. So the pro women go first, then the age groupers, and then the men are on Saturday. So it'll be pretty busy in town. <laughs> yeah. I mean, basically they're going to, there will be twice the number of athletes racing because they're going to, they're going to pack that pier both days. Uh, so that, so you've got twice the number of athletes racing twice the number of entourages who are following the athletes and helping and supporting the athletes. And then um, I think the real, the really interesting and, and challenging piece is going to be uh, one, the impact on the local community to have, mm -hmm things shut down for that many days yeah no I've already heard that from people yeah. that live there yeah and then you know the second thing is just the people who are volunteering and actually working I mean it's to have two days of racing for the <laughs> 70.3 worlds that's it's it's a lot but it's you know you're done each day by whatever five or six two Ironman full Ironman distance races in three days well we'll see yeah. I know. I was saying I'm not going this year because it's going to be so crazy. And I know Jerry Rott, the race director of Lava Man, she was like, I'm heading out of town. Everyone there mm -hmm. seems to be leaving, <laughs> you know, and they're renting her car and her house and her condo because Iron Man needs all the help that they can get. So it's mm -hmm. going to be crazy, but exciting to be all back there. Cause I, I, I love to go as you know, I'm always there, even if I'm not racing and just as like see your annual community of our you know, friends that are there every year. You just don't see people unless you all go. There's so many races now. So it's, it's always good time to be there, but, uh, this year I'll have to watch from on online, but mm -hmm. I'm sure it'll be busy. So how do you keep track of all the athletes? Like you're at all the races now you're, are you helping broadcast or re finish uh, line no, or what are you doing? It's, it's pretty easy to follow a lot of the key races just because a lot of them are, are streamed live. So big Ironman races, uh, the PTO races, mm -hmm. like uh, PTO US Open in Dallas last weekend, you know, streamed live. So <clears throat> it's not quite the same as being there in person and watching, but you, you know, you can get a, can get a pretty good feel for, 
you know, who people are and how they're, how they're racing and how they like to race and mm -hmm. maybe expectations that they have, or you think they at levels that they can be at, but maybe they're not. And so then that begs the question, well, what's going on with that athlete? Like, you know, in Dallas, I think Lionel Sanders was 21st. So it's like, Hmm, mm. <laughs> what happened there? You know, I mean, the guy's, the guy's a badass and he mm -hmm. should be one of the top, top tier people. And, uh, Maybe something went wrong. I don't know. But anyway, just interesting. Yeah, you can follow, as you know, with social media and live streaming and everything going on now, it's, yeah, you don't have to be at races to kind of keep a good pulse on things. No, I don't mean be there, but just like how to yeah. keep track of everyone. There's just so many different athletes as these new people coming yeah. in and then the yeah, older well, end. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest. I don't feel like I know everybody at, at, at all. There's There's names that appear in the top five or top 10, like, wait a minute, where did this person come from? You know? Mm -hmm. And so I have to go and look and search and see what their, their history is. So no, it's, it's very hard because there are more races, more opportunities, more pros, more young people coming up and without having really huge key events year after year after year, because of, you know, COVID, a lot of them have slipped through my cracks anyway, as far as mm -hmm. keeping track of them. So mm -hmm. So with the athletes that you've been coaching a long time, and obviously you've been an athlete for a long time and really learning how to master the endurance sport that as Ironman specifically, how do you see people training nowadays? Do you see a trend in doing the training, low heart rate, the max aerobic function, maffetone type of stuff we've talked about for years, and then adding in speed work. Do you think people are still overtraining? How do you, do you notice and pay attention to that? How people train and recover and prepare for races? Um, I don't think there's any one sort of general philosophy that's that's being followed specifically. Um, you know, some people are super dialed into doing a lot of aer aerobic training and a little bit of speed work, you know, so the mm -hmm. more the maffetone and other folks, especially people that don't have a lot of time to train, have tended to lean a little bit more toward having a little bit more uh, percentage of their training be higher quality, even though their total volume is a lot less because they just don't have the time to do it. And they also seem to be getting equally good results. So, you know, there's there's more than one way to- Skin a cat. Skin a cat. Yeah, that, <laughs> I knew there was something with a cat. I couldn't, I couldn't remember what it was. <laughs> more than one way to feed a cat, tickle yeah, a cat, something. poke its hair. I don't know what it is, but anyway, yeah. Uh -huh. In that cat, ow! <laughs> But so anyway, um, with like, how do you, you're coaching people and we'll talk to uh, you about share about TriDot, but what's your philosophy training? As I did, I was sharing the intro. I did, I think it's 2002 or 2003, the Mark Allen coaching program. And we did a lot of low heart rate and then we added in speed work. And then I started qualifying for Hawaii. And so what's your philosophy? Is it still the same? And how are you implementing into TriDot? Yeah, my philosophy is, is basically the same with the exception that um, I, I, I can see that I have seen over the years that, um, the ideal sort of maffetone aerobic base, a little bit of speed work type of, uh, training philosophy works one, if you have a lot of time to train. And also if you're also diligent with your strength work, mm -hmm. because you're not working your muscles quite at the same level, um, as you do when you do harder training, you know, the harder training is higher stress on your body. So you can't do as much of it. But anyway, so um, if people are trying to stick to, you know, doing a lot of aerobic training, a little bit of speed work, but they don't have a lot of time to train, uh, you know, they just won't be getting in sort of the enough volume of training to get those big, strong changes in fitness that you're searching for. If you have a lot of time to train and you can do a lot of those longer, more steady workouts, for sure it will work. And, and then if you also are diligent with speed work, you're going to have the muscular integrity while you're doing that base training so that when you do go faster in races or throw in your speed work, you, your muscles are going to work right. If you're not doing the strength work along with it, um, you just end up kind of having this mono speed that you can go and you can never go up to the ne that next level. So it, it, it depends on what an athlete likes to do and has time to do and is um, committed to doing in their training. Um, I have found that 
a lot of triathletes, you know, they might do uh they might do a core workout or, you know, some kind of little, little body weight functional strength thing, but they don't, they're not consistent with it. And when they're not consistent with it, if they're actually doing supplementing that with a little bit of, you know, harder training, then they still get good results. Mm -hmm. And if they don't overdo the total volume of training that they're doing, they're going to be able to absorb it, but it's a fine line. And so that's where actually TriDoc comes in because they have their founder, Jeff Boer has been, he's been coaching athletes for many years and he, he's very analytical with everything. And he's really just tracked how different kinds of training affect uh, people's fitness and performance. And, um, you know, looking at stuff and he's created a lot of algorithms that that factor in so many different aspects of the data that we're able to collect nowadays uh, that can go into actually um, keep continually helping an athlete's training plan be fine-tuned as they go through their, their season. So, sort of one way that I, I like to describe it is, um, like if I was to compare 1980, you know, the 1980s triathlon training versus the 2020s triathlon training, mm -hmm. It's sort of like if if you look at medicine, you know, the old doctor would show up at your house with a stethoscope and stick it on your chest and say, okay, now breathe, now cough. And that's the tool that they had to try to figure out what was going on. Well, obviously you're not going to find as much stuff as you will nowadays when you can stick somebody and get, let's say an MRI on their mm -hmm. knee or their shoulder or whatever, and see what's really going on inside. So with all of the data that we have now, um, I was finding it difficult to feel feel like as a coach, I was able to sort of as, assimilate enough of it in there to actually really utilize it in a way that made sense, not only for me, but then to help keep fine tuning an athlete's training plan. With TriDot, that is what's taking place. And so it's it's been a super cool move for me to move all of my athletes and to move my training platform over there. Uh, and it's not just about numbers though, also, because TriDot has a huge, um, they have a huge social following in their Facebook page and people are very supportive of each other. And, and, you know, Hey, I'm coming to, you know, Milwaukee for USAT nationals. Is anybody else going to be there? You know, that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. community, so you're, you're even, even if you maybe do a lot of your training on your own, you feel like you're part of this, yeah. this community and it's, and it's just really fun. Uh, and so it's exciting for me to be involved with it. You know, that's a key thing you just said, because triathlon can be such a solo sport and you're alone <laughs> if you're not training with people, because if you're doing the lower heart rate training, you can't do group rides and mm -hmm. go by your heart rate very well. You know, you're probably cheating if you are <laughs> like, I would always have to do just train with a couple other people and that it's okay if we're spread all apart but you know, you're by yourself a lot. So I think finding that team feeling a community is so essential for a sport as triathlon is that you need to have that connection with other people and have the social events. Like if, like I joined San Diego tri club, they have events all the time. Cause you're, I think when you're on your training or in a race, you're kind of by yourself. So it's nice to be able to meet people that way and feel looking forward to seeing them in person <laughs> that you're talking to online is good. Yeah. Like, you know, when I, when I trained, I, I had my handful of training partners that I did a lot of my training with. And yes, I was trying to get faster and trying to improve my performance and all of that. Um, but the real thing that I love was just meeting, meeting my training partners for the key workouts and doing them together. And and it became sort of like an, an exploratory adventure because we were all trying to all trying to get better and trying to sort of help each other get better and trying new things and running ideas behind by each other. And, you know, I think probably most triathletes, even though they might be a little more solitary than some other sport oriented mm -hmm. folks, like if you're a, you know, if you're a football player, you're team oriented, right. Yeah. But ultimately triathlon is a team. Also, you have your team of training partners you have your team of family mem members who for sure is, are, are probably going to pick up some of the slack when you get really focused on a big race that's coming up and um yeah it's just pretty cool which is why again i like to go to ironman hawaii because you get we cause it's like annual reunion <laughs> with everyone and some crazy people like diana hassel they're still racing probably <laughs> there. 
every year that don't get exhausted and carry Craig. So it's always fun to see people. So with training, as we age and we are busy and chronic stress is always an issue for people is your, the formula options when you're creating programs for people, like a, the minimal effective dose, like going shorter workouts on the weekdays when people are working a lot and going longer in the weekend. Is there, do you look at that for people when you're creating a program for how many hours a week that they have available and how to make it most effective? Cause so many people are so busy already. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's one of the things and one of the key sort of questions that you have to answer and try it out when you're, when training plans are being set up is how much time do you have to train? You know, let's, let's be realistic here. And if you've got 10 to 12 hours a week, then we're going to train you 10 to 12 hours a week. We're not going to try to throw in an 18 to 20 hour week or 24 hour week because you just don't have that time. And triathlon should reduce the stress in your life. It should be something that enhances your health, enhances your your sense of well-being. And uh, if you're trying to cram in hours more of training, even though maybe it is ideal and if, but your life is not set up to be a pro triathlete, you gotta be realistic. And so try it out is definitely, you know, that's one of the key questions that gets, that gets asked and that's, and so it, it helps optimize people's training based on the reality of their life. Mm -hmm. Or some people probably overestimate, you know, what they can put in, but over time they'll start to see like, oh yeah, okay. I, I am stressing myself out. I'm not getting enough sleep. And, yeah. you know, one of the things that you, you just sort of threw out there was uh, as people get older, things change. And, you know, that's definitely something that, that I'm tuned into now because I'm going to be I'm going to be on <laughs> Medicare in a couple months, you know, cause I'll be 65. <laughs> you know, like you're Crazy. an old dude. <laughs> like, I know. Oh, where's my cane? You know, but, <laughs> um, and so I'm trying to figure out how do I optimize this journey as I continue on now into, um, you know, what, what is well into the second half of my life. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting that, um, so many of the principles that, that are, that are going to get somebody really fast and fit when they're 30 are also the same things that are going to help you out as you are getting older. But the key things become more important. So what are some of those key things? Well, one of them, uh, you know, as you age, you you have to, you, it, recovery becomes an issue, obviously. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to need a little more time for recovery and supporting that through increasing the percent of your diet that is from protein because your body has a harder time assimilating protein. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that can, can be one issue that triathletes have is they're just not getting enough good quality protein so that their, their muscles that are breaking down and training get rebuilt and they're built building up into a stronger, uh, better athlete. Uh, second thing is absolutely as you age, you know, strength training is such a key element. You can, you can swim, bike, and run until the cows come home, uh, but you're going to lose lean muscle if you don't do strength training. But if you do strength training, you can maintain so much of that strength that you had even 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. And so that's something that that I'm pretty religious about is is my strength training that I that I still do. You look pretty buff, by the way. I've seen your some videos with the is it the mirror or what's your oh the, tonal tonal sorry <laughs> uh, all the workouts you're you're ripped, man. 65 is you're looking like 55. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. I was, I was in the grocery store today and, and every Tuesday and Thursday at the health food store that I shop at it's seniors day and <laughs> you have to be 65 to get the senior discount. It's today's Thursday. So it's one of the discount days. Uh, and you're supposed to show your ID. And so I bought a bunch of groceries and I checked out and I looked up and the guy had just not not even ask me what my age is or anything he'd already given me the senior discount i'm like <laughs> oh cool oh oh wait a minute wait a minute oh, <laughs> be a wait minute. <laughs> a minute dude <laughs> you think i'm over 65 full dang yeah. i thought right. i looked better than that but <laughs> anyway so um, everyone gets it you just should have told you that everyone gets a discount right. if they come in the store <laughs> So anyway, uh, you know, good quality sleep is so important as you yes. age um, for recovery so that your brain works, so that your brain gets flushed and, and refreshed at night mm -hmm. and your muscles can repair. Um, strength work, as I mentioned, 
also uh, and then and then added added uh, a higher percentage of your, of your diet coming from protein so that you can actually have the raw materials to rebuild your muscles that need, need repair and then um, another piece that's really interesting for people as they age is you still need to do speed work um, and if you do the right amount of speed work you can maintain a, a VO2 max that is very, very high, that will not fall off as much as you might think. Um, and older people get um, a lot more changes in their mitochondria, the little powerhouse cells, parts of your cell that generates energy, they get bigger changes in their mitochondria for speed work than somebody who's younger. So a younger person has to do a lot more speed work to get the same changes in their mitochondria, mm. which is basically kind of how you are able to keep going faster and faster and faster. Um, but the, the challenge as you age is that you just can't manage as many weeks of speed work mm -hmm. before you fall off the edge again, you know? And so yeah. a young person might be able to handle, you know, who knows what, 10, 12, 15 weeks in a row of, of doing some pretty good quality speed work before they start to overdo it and get overtrained and they have to back it down. You know, an older person, how old is old? I don't know. 50, 55, 65, whatever, they might only be able to handle four weeks or five weeks or six weeks of doing higher intensity speed work before they start to get that overtrained fatigue feeling. And so, it, you know, if you are tuned into your body and are, are kind of just listening and, and seeing how you're responding, seeing how you're recovering, you can, you can sort of balance that going back and forth between the higher intensity stuff and then doing, going back into a little more base work um, so those are some of the things that take place at, as you're aging. Yeah. And, and, oh, and then the last piece, and this is super interesting for me, is that the, uh, you know, they've, they've done a lot of research recently and found that swimming and cycling, you can, you can maintain almost a lot of that same speed and, and, and strength that you had for those sports at, as you had when you were younger. So the, the fall off in performance in cycling and running is uh, uh, sorry cycling and swimming is very gradual mm -hmm. as you age however the fall off in running is a little bit steeper big for me really steep angle <laughs> yeah big steep angle right and so um and so the the begs the question why what's going on and um some of the really cool research is showing that uh the muscles that start to go first in people as they age that seem to get weaker quicker are your, your feet and ankle and calf muscles. And those are the ones that you need to run fast, right? And, and so, you know, think about a young person, just even the way they walk, you know, they're, they're strutting and their foot is articulating and their toes are moving and their ankle is moving and they're, you know, they're activating all of those lower leg muscles. Mm -hmm. But then think about, you know, grandma or grandpa who looks like they're walking on, <laughs> on blocks and they're not articulating their feet at all. They're not moving their ankle. They're not activating those muscles. And so that's something that I have been emphasizing for my folks that I coach who are getting up there in age and who are feeling like, geez, I can't run like I used to. I, I say, walk like a teenager, <laughs> articulate your feet. When you go for a run, move your feet, move your ankle, articulate them. And do balance work to strengthen those muscles. And, and as you do that, if you articulate your feet and move and, you know, flex and use your ankle, you're also going to be um, working that calf muscle. And as you do that, then you can maintain a lot of that strength that's required to continue to run fast. So that's your, that's, that's your training tip for the next, <laughs> whatever. 20 years. I know. I find that I just saw this chiropractor guy and my ankles were so tight. Cause I was like, I'm on a mission because my running performance is like the steep hill. And I've been trying to do all this, you know, Stacy Sims research, the short intensity intervals for women, 20, 30 seconds and doing the knees over the toes guy video, trying to do is backwards walking and backwards hill running and going on the beach and doing stuff. And so I'm trying everything that I read about, but it is, you know, it's, like that constant fight with hormones for females and how you mm -hmm. have to eat more protein and lift heavier weights. Like I'll do three to six repetitions. I'm not, you know, 10 to 15 reps is not what I do. And I just lift heavier. And I think it's just for women, especially as we age, we have to really fight 
the hor- loss of hormones and embrace the aging process, not blame it, but change how we train. And so we mm-hmm. are eating protein throughout the day. And that's what I think I've talked a lot about on this podcast recently, because I think we got stuck into doing all this fasted exercise, fasted training, and then we're doing one or two meals a day and we're exercising three times a day. <laughs> and so mm-hmm. we're having this energy deficit that we're not, I guess called energy flux is a new word I keep hearing about, but we're having, not getting enough energy in because we're not, you know, we're training and we're moving around, we're doing stuff, but we're just not getting enough protein in. And I'm really been trying that myself too. Cause it's hard because you're not hungry and you're busy and you're like, Oh yeah, I barely eaten today. And it's, yeah, just, you know, gotta work it. And like Stacy Sims says about women, we are not small men, you know, <laughs> and yeah. um, it, I, I really love uh, the research that she's been doing and just the, the fact that she's putting it out there. Like, you know, what? especially as, as women, when women go through menopause, you know, it's we're not like guys. We and we can't train. We have different things that we have to be very specific attending to if we're going to keep our health and performance up there. One of the things with protein, in my, in my opinion, anyway, that can be a challenge is that, you know, as we age, um, we get it gets harder and harder for our bodies to metabolize carbohydrate, you know, because mm-hmm. over our lifetime, every time you eat carbohydrate, your body really releases a little insulin so that it stores it away, you know, and so that it's, you know, stores it as glycogen. And then if you eat a lot, then it gets stored as fat. Um but insulin is a little bit toxic to our cells. And so over our lifetime, our s- cell membranes slowly get a little bit harder because that ke- keeps the insulin from getting in. So as you get older, it gets harder and harder to, to metabolize carbohydrate. And so uh, that can set somebody up for eating more carbohydrate to sort of you know, get their energy yeah. up. And then next thing you know, if, if you start getting into that carbohydrate cycle, then your body's not searching for protein. It's searching for carbohydrate to get your blood sugar up because your your body's having a problem metabolizing it. To sort of counter that, as you know, um, you know, not restricting severely our carbohydrate intake, but just keeping it very moderate. Um and then also just really making sure that uh, you, that you are doing some aerobic exercise because aerobic as opposed to anaerobic increases your cells sensitive si- sensitivity to insulin. So it helps um, counter that natural thing over a lifetime where we get less sensitive to insulin. We got to release more and it's harder to metabolize carbohydrate. So if you are doing aerobic workouts, you know, walking, moderate jogging, easy, easy, moderate swimming, you know, whatever it is, you're helping your body to stay sensitive to insulin, which means you can still manage carbohydrates. And if you manage carbohydrates well, then you're also going to probably be wanting to have some of that protein. So it's a positive yes. feedback. Yeah, I think, you know, I always talk on the show that people go all or none, you know, they hear get into the keto world and fasted exercise and think just eat hot tons of fat, all carbs are bad. And then they get into fasted exercise that I'm not eating anything. I'm going to go for this long ride and long run. And I think we create a little more problems sometimes if we mm-hmm. keep doing that too much and then, you know, not focusing on the protein. And I think it gets confusing. We keep talking about what are carbohydrates, you know, to eat and when to eat them that they're nature's carbohydrates and real food sources. So getting rid of the processed foods, the refined oils, the vegetable oils, and the refined sugars is what we talk about. Eat real food. That's nutrient dense. That balances your blood sugar. So it doesn't mm. lead to insulin resistance. But, you know, I think a lot of people get scared of eating any carbohydrate <laughs> that gets too because a lot of athletes that get into the low carb world, they are so, you know, type a and do everything they read, but they don't personalize it and realize, Oh, I do need a little bit more fuel. And I am kind of feeling sluggish and that workout wasn't so good today. Oh, I was higher heart rate. Shouldn't I'm burning more (laughs) muscle glycogen. Doesn't that mean I should refuel or eat something beforehand? So I think it's, you know, matching your fueling with your training is what I talk Mm -hmm. a lot about and figuring that out for that individual, because if you are doing a higher intensity speed key workout, would you have as a coach for you, would you have athletes eat something beforehand and 
you know, figure out their nutrition and all. Do you work on that with them or have that in your probably blogs, how to coach people with nutrition and then putting protein in afterwards? Is it three hours, 30 minutes? You know, all that. I think people forget about to help recovery. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I just try not, I try to emphasize um, not being afraid of food yeah. and um, to, and, and anything that's super extreme or restrictive will have a short-term benefit, but there's going to be some pay, you're going to pay the price somewhere along the way. And so, and again, this also goes back to, you know, guys and gals bodies are a little bit different. So, you know, a, a, a male athlete can do in general, a little bit better on a super low carbohydrate diet, like a keto diet than, than women seem to do. And so women, especially after menopause need more, need a little bit of carbohydrate to actually train well, but I don't care who you are. If you're a human being and you're not getting carbohydrate, you know, if you're, if you're training at a snail's pace, you might feel okay. But if you're actually trying to um, improve your fitness and put a little of intensity into it, you're probably going to feel kind of lousy a lot of the time. And I've had, there's so many athletes that I've coached who go, I'm going to go uh, on a keto diet so that my body gets good at burning fat. I'm like, okay, well, let me know how you feel. All right. You know, and, <laughs> and so, you know, they go through the, the tough phase in the beginning, you know, and, and till, till they get used to it. But then when they start to look at it in the bigger picture, they realize they haven't felt good in training since they stopped, since they started restricting the carbohydrate. And so, you know, it's it, like you said, it has to match your output level first and foremost. And so if you're not training much, you're not going to need a lot of calories and you won't need as many carbohydrates. If you're training a ton, you know, fat burns in the flame of carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. And so even if you're doing a purely fat burning workout, you're still needing carbohydrate to um, fuel that fat breakdown process for energy. And so, you know, that's just basic physiology stuff. And of course the human body is it's designed to um, be able to survive extreme situations, right? So mm -hmm. back in ancient times, maybe there were times where people didn't have carbohydrate, maybe like in the winter when, um, you know, there's snow on the ground. The only thing you have is a moose, Yeah, you know, your body can manage and figure it out and, and m metabolize and go into ketosis and you're going to be okay. But in general, extremes uh, come with a price. Yeah, it's cycling in and out. People are not athletes. That example of winter versus summer, you know, summer, you have berries. You have different foods available than in wintertime when you don't have any fresh food growing on the ground. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. yeah, it totally makes sense to me, like ancestral perspective of what to eat, when, why, and how. But for the athletes, that's what I try to do in this show because there's so much information out there for people trying to do fasting, trying to do keto, carnivore, whatever things hot and really go, okay, that's not for the person doing at least one, two workouts a day. A lot of athletes might be doing some days I do three. If I, you know, go lift in the morning or bike ride in the morning, then I swim masters at lunchtime. Then I go lift weights at nighttime or go for a walk or, you know, do something yoga. And most people don't do anything. <laughs> so the guidelines out there are not for endurance athletes or triathletes that are doing a lot of activity. Mm -hmm. So I always try to, okay, take that information and let's put it in for you. The endurance athletes can be a little different. Yeah. And, and, you know, and let's go to the other extreme, somebody who's maybe not athletic, who's heavy, you know, they've become very insulin resistant because their, their body, they've had excess body fat for many years and they're not exercising they might need to go pretty restrictive initially yeah. to get their body sensitive to insulin again. You know, they've got to take the, the load off of their body from trying to metabolize carbohydrate and they can't do it anymore. And so they just, no matter how much they exercise, they're not going to lose weight. Like I have a, a, a gentleman that I coach who was, he's pretty heavy. He's a big guy. And, um, and and he ended up doing uh he wanted to train for an ironman he ended up doing ironman boulder doing big miles doing everything right and he didn't lose an ounce which know? is why i do what i do by the way <laughs> yeah and, so. 
And then finally, a couple of years after he went through his triathlon journey, he he connected with a guy who is very similar to what you, you're talking about. And initially, you know, the guy said, okay, you've got to really, you've got to really restrict the carbohydrate to get your body sensitive to, in, to insulin again. And you're not, we're not going to have you doing any kind of um, pure aerobic stuff. We're going to have you doing strength training mm -hmm. because as you strength train your body, your, your whole metabolic metabolic rate is going to go up because it takes a huge amount of energy to repair broken down muscle. And, you know, when you do strength training, that breaks down muscle. And so all of a sudden his metabolism was going way up because he was doing a, a very structured strength training for his workouts. Um, he cut, you know, restricted the carbohydrates initially quite a bit. And all of a sudden he's like shedding weight and now he looks phenomenal mm -hmm. he's, and he's healthy you know, and he's, he's gradually added back as his body has changed the carbohydrates so that it's, it's matching his current Timed. state yeah. and current needs. So, yeah, I think that's, I always say why I do what I do is when I, you know, started Ironman's 2001 and started going to Hawaii in 2000 and marathons before that, that you see all these people at the races going, okay, why are people overweight? <laughs> you know, why are they not losing weight? And how I used to say, I would do you know, Ironman's every year and train all year. And I wouldn't lose any weight. Your body would get used to it too. But I think, you know, even at this trail run, which is Paris, Texas last weekend, I was right. I was in Dallas on Sunday. Didn't realize the race was there. Anyways, I saw these people doing a 50 K trail run and a hundred K trail run. They were not lean and strong. You think, Oh, <laughs> how many calories are you burning? That doesn't equal how much fat you lose training for those. So it's, mm -hmm. that's why I got into, I think nutritional therapy and functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner way do functional lab testing assessment now and putting it to a personalized program because so many athletes just do the training and don't do what I call the holistic method working on the whole person. So mm -hmm. uh going back to what you're saying with their training program and looking at recovery, do you measure heart rate variability and getting into sleep data like I wear an aura ring and track my deep sleep and REM and make sure my readiness, heart rate variability, do you do any of those metrics or do they put that into try if, if people want to, yeah, for sure. Um, and I think I think the use and guidelines of of how to use uh, HRV is it's in its initial stages. I think it'll get even better and more refined as time goes on, and we see because again, there's a there's a lot of variability in heart rate variability, uh -huh. and um, and a lot of it is sort of uh, kind of what is what is normal for you. So somebody yeah. might have a normal heart rate variability for them, but it's only normal in the sense that maybe they're constantly overtrained. And so that looks like they're normal. <laughs> that looks like they're normal. And so when they have, when they go even lower than that, then they're like right on the edge, you know? And so um, anyway, the, it, it is good. And it's interesting too, because I have a, a, there's a gentleman that I coach that for decades, he's, he gets five to six hours of sleep a night and he's fine. And for me, I need nine to 10. Right. And so, <laughs> We um, started measuring his his sleep patterns and our heart rate variability and amount of time in deep sleep where he's get, actually recovering. And as it basically what it turns out is like the dude is probably the most efficient sleeper on the planet <laughs> because in his five or six hours, he gets quality. easily as much high quality sleep as I get in my nine or 10. So even though I, I need nine or 10, to feel good. Um, it's just because I'm not a very efficient sleeper and I sleep fine. You know, I'm asleep, but I, I, I don't. It, so anyway, there's so many the percentage uh, of deep sleep. It yeah. There's is individual, such individual variation. So it's good to have some of that tracking just to see where you're at and give yourself a reality check from mm -hmm. time to time, even if it's not something you do every single night and you don't want to be a slave to it. Maybe some people do, some people don't, but yeah. Super good information. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. I, I've just, all the athletes have been on the carb, you know, more carbs and doing what we were taught to do with the drink mixes and, you know, all the liquid calories every hour and all the stuff that I used to try to do. And I end up getting sick. because I was trying to do too many calories and too much fuel in every hour. Didn't work for me, but I was, would be interesting to see study of how many athletes, endurance athletes have high insulin levels in their A1C and look at that. If they are kind of the standard American 
endurance athlete diet, eating the ton of the processed foods and the carbohydrates and the bars and the gels and all that. I wonder how insulin resistance people are plus with stress and stress, it raises your glucose, which will give you insulin resistance as well as the end result. But it's my frustration lately is getting your comprehensive blood chemistry covered by insurance with your doctor. They don't do insulin. And I was trying to get my doctor to do it. Like, well, you don't have any history of diabetes. I'm like, yeah, I don't want to have it. <laughs> so taste test my insulin. And I looked it up in Alta labs. You can do it yourself for $25. So yeah. I don't know why we're not more preventative with our medical system, but I think people athletes, especially if you want to be what I always say, fit and healthy from the inside out, have to take their own health into their own hands, take that ownership and get mm. labs ordered from your doctor as much as you can. Then look at direct labs or ultra labs, where you can just go to lab core quests and get these numbers because there's, I mean, my numbers are higher and I wonder how long they were high. You know, I just, mm -hmm. you don't know unless you test. So you don't know yeah, what you I, don't know. <laughs> I've, I've been working with inside tracker this year. Yeah, me too. And, and they're, that's super interesting for me because they, you know, they measure 40 some different markers in your blood. And, you know, if some things I, then the first test that I took, some things, most things were normal, but there were a few things that were off and they gave very specific recommendations on what I could do to, to correct those, to bring things back down into the normal range. And also what's super cool was that, um, as if you know, since you've worked with them, they have a thing called your inner age. Mm -hmm. So as opposed to your chronological age, and I thought, well, heck, you know, I, <laughs> I exercise, right. I eat really well. I get sleep. I'm try, I try to moderate my stress, blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, I went over to inner age after I got the first blood test and it goes, congratulations, you are younger than your chronological age by four oh. months, <laughs> four months. I'm like, so I'm scared. Four? I haven't taken that test. <laughs> I'm like, what? You know? How can, with all the things that I do, how can I only be four months younger than like every other guy out there who's, you know, 64 years old. And so they said, no, that's actually really pretty good for your first test. And, and so anyway, I went through all of the, the, the recommendations that they had on, on the things that needed improvement. I also um, have been working with a company called tenant products and they, they make, a lot of different nutraceutical products and, and things that really help you recover and rebuild yourself on a very cellular level. And so I was taking their products to help recover, you know, not only my body, but also to kind of get my brain to just like function really smoothly. Six months after that first test, doing these just simple things, got the second results. And I was now six years younger than my chronological age. Wow. Six That's a huge success story. Yeah. Six years and six months in six months. And so that for me was just like a dramatic example. I'm of, sold. Well, and, and the thing that's really interesting for me was that I feel like I'm obviously pretty healthy and, and nothing that I had was showing up clinically at this point in time, as far as disease or, mm -hmm. you know, heavy duty illness or any, anything like that. However, if I had not done this and done these things to correct the things that were, you know, kind of out of the range, I wouldn't have known until yeah. I, you know, God forbid, had a heart attack or, yeah. you know, got that, you know, whatever it is. And so that's why I think it's, as you just said, you know, it's, it's super important for people to take charge of their own health, to really look under the hood, you know, not just how many miles can you run on your long yeah. run, but what's going on phys physiologically in your body and yeah. where can you improve those weak links? And you it's know, so easy to do. That was what was amazing for me. And it's not that expensive. And I always laugh for years, you know, focusing on more a practitioner into my health coaching with combining it with fitness and nutrition coaching is that people rather drop $10,000 on a bike or wheels. But if you say, okay, you need to spend $2,000 on lab tests or $500. <laughs> oh my God. No, I can't. I can't afford that. I'm like, well, if you need a new bike, how would you pay for that? <laughs> mm -hmm. It's so funny how just athletes just think about, you know, their equipment, but don't think about what I always say this year is training your future self train for now, but how do you want to be living your life when you're 60, 70, 80 years old? As I just lost my dad in June, mm -hmm. I was looking like, Hey, he was, look at people in the hospitals. Like, I don't want to be living like that at 80 and not be able to walk and 
you know, have back pain and then have all this digestion stuff going on. And it's like, so preventative what we're doing now for our bodies. And I think being, that's why I strive to show that being a fit and healthy athlete, performing your best in life now and in your future life, that is so essential to doing what we're doing every year, (laughs) every day is to, you know, do the testing quarterly. You know, you don't know what's going on unless you test. So you could feel good, but like you said earlier, your normal of feeling good could be like quarter of what you could be your full mm-hmm. potential. You're not quite living your life to your fullest that you could do. If yep. you did a Absolutely. couple things. So that's a great example. Okay. So we're running out of time as always. I do just sit here and talk to everyone, but the tips for people to get started to work on maybe some performance races for end of this season coming up soon. But so if we're looking at next year, they want to do a race, Maybe they want to do Olympic distance races that I might do finally next year. What would you suggest them doing how to get started if they want to coach with you? Well, you can go to, um, you can go to try dot and, and sign up as, uh, and have me as, as your coach. I'm also, we're going to be launching the Mark Allen edition in try dot, uh, probably in the next two weeks, sometime right before Kona. And in that you get all of the training that try dot, um, has, which is super, customized for your situation, who you are, where you're at, based on assessments that you do. And then there's going to, there's just tons of uh, video content that we've been recording over the last six months that will go into each one of your, each one of your days training. So, you know, there's showing you how to do proper uh, strength training and core exercises and functional moves and um, different tips and drills so that you become more efficient at swimming, cycling, and running. And really explaining a lot of the philosophies behind the different types of workouts that that you'll get from me. Mm -hmm. And so you check that out. That's going to launch. That's, that's a great entry point for anybody who um, wants to get going. It's the Mark Allen edition in TriDot. And um, you know, it's, it's a low, it's a low commitment in a sense on your part, but it will just propel you from, you know, ground zero up to full speed, you know, so, so efficiently, It'll help you pre, uh, sort of circumvent all the pitfalls that a lot of triathletes make or a lot of athletes make who are trying to figure it out on their own. And you don't have to think. You just have to show up, look, see what you do and do it. You know, and it's so it's such a great um, it's a great tool and a great program that we put together. We've been working on that this actually this whole year and then with wow. the content, like I said, for the last six months or so. I'm laughing. Did you repurpose any of the videos, exercises we did? 2012, 10 years ago, <laughs> we did all those exercises with Aaron Carson at Rally Sport. Those yeah, no, the archives. We didn't, <laughs> yeah, we didn't, we didn't use those, but uh, not in TriDot anyway. Oh, uh, that's funny. So people can get started. Good time to work on their base training in the winter and strength training and work on that off season. I think it's so important. I think, cause I know some people doing Hanu half Ironman is June that you know, they're thinking they don't need to start to later, but this is the time to start work on your base training, work on techniques, swimming drills, work on, cause swimming is usually most people's area of opportunity and mm-hmm. really getting that strength training in off season where you can really build stability, the core muscles and get all that lower heart rate outside training and fresh air. So I think it's a good time to look into that. Do you have like a private group page you'll do for TriDot with your people that you're coaching, like a monthly Q and a with Mark on a yeah. private page. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We're going to be yeah. doing kind of like a regular, we've actually been doing it kind of just like an ask, ask me anything type of, uh, thing about once a month. So on the TriDot website. Or? Yeah. Okay. Now yeah. we stream it live through th- their Facebook. Uh, but in, anyway, there's always announcements on that when, when I'll be going on and um, yeah, they're real. Try out's really good at, as far as continually putting out podcasts and information and really just helping the athletes sort of continually be better and better, better educated on training and equipment and, you know, community and just all sorts of stuff. So yeah, really good. I've been following their emails and then talking to them about their program a little bit. So, cause I, I'm doing all the other stuff. So if someone can write their program for them and then I'll do the other, (laughs) that's Mm -hmm. great because I can't, it's so hard to do all of it. (laughs) So you need someone to write their training program and then someone else to do the, the exercise strength Mm -hmm. in their nutrition and their sleep and stress and lab testing. So that's great. 
Okay. And what other races? We've got Ironman in Hawaii. Do you have to, more stuff committed for the next year yet? Or are you just done kind of get some off season time? Just going to make it through Kona and then uh, take it from there. I'll, I'll probably end up at St. George for 70.3 worlds just because it's so close. Um, that's in November. When is that November? That, that's I think it's the last weekend in October. So it's, okay. it's, I think it's three weeks after Kona, which is so close, so close, but yeah. Huh. Yeah. I'm sure there's a lot of people doing both. There probably are a few crazy people doing both. Yeah. <laughs> I would yeah. say that I started traveling to Europe, except for the last three years when I stopped doing racing, how much money you spend on racing. You could go to Europe three times a year <laughs> for the amount of money <laughs> races cost nowadays and all the travel fees and hotels and everything. It's an expensive sport these days from when I started way back mm. when. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it, it can be expensive, you know, but I, I think, you know, the most, the most important thing about the sport is, is really seeing what it is that you're getting out of it and what the, the real goal that you hopefully are getting out of doing triathlons or, or just the training is that you feel better. It, it reduces yeah. stress. It, it provides you with an opportunity to just let go of your problems for that time when you're out there training. Yeah. And it's just, therapy. Yeah. It's your therapy. And I know how it was for me. Like I could be having a really lousy day. And then I'm, you know, I know that I'm meeting my training partners at, for a run or a bike or whatever. And right away, you know, when you're with them, it's like, oh yeah, you, you forget about your problems. I mean, they're there, you know, that they'll be there when you get home, but you just get this break, you yeah. know, and it, it's pause it's from such, life. <laughs> yeah. It's such a positive. Yeah. That's good. I know. Well, if you ever come down at North San Diego, I see Bob Babbitt at Fletcher's Cove every now and then. And we've got Scott Tinley, I think is the one at the Bay Club where I work out. And then, you know, my friend Renee and Jeff Milton. And uh, so all these other extra athletes live down here. It seems to be the popular hub to retire triathlon career <laughs> or keep at it. The ones that never <laughs> left. <laughs> yeah. The ones that stayed down here for 30 years. So yeah, yeah, I hope to see you on Ironman live TV in Kona, but I, I will be there for lava man. I'll be helping with the race in March in Kona. So that's my <laughs> contribution to the triathlon industry. So thanks Mark for your time today. And we'll put everything in the show notes, any links we didn't talk about, we'll put it in there and people can check out TriDot with Mark Allen. Awesome. Thanks, Debbie. Great to.